Hey y'all, I'm Brooke Hoover, a Louisiana native, actor, writer, and comedian. I've lost 100 pounds through diet and exercise, or shall I say, lifestyle changes. My 20 year and counting health journey has taught me that just like taking a diet pill for weight loss, body positivity doesn't magically happen overnight. I'm working on regaining my self-esteem and rekindling my love affair with Cajun and Southern comfort food in a healthier way, all the while juggling eating as clean as I can, reestablishing myself in the entertainment industry, which, as we know, is historically fat-phobic, all the while showing my inner fat girl some love. That's fat with a PH. Pretty hot and tempting. Let me tell y'all a tale or two. What's up, y'all? Right now, with the SAG-AFTRA and Writers Guild strikes looming, sidebar podcasts aren't included in this strike, the contracts that we're fighting, so I'm allowed to be doing what I'm doing and doing it well, or at least I hope. This got me thinking about all of the many actor-friendly side hustles I've had over the years, and being a standardized patient is one of those side hustles. The standardized human doesn't necessarily know what a standardized patient is until I explain it like, you know, like that Seinfeld episode where Kramer is a standardized patient, and that's when people usually go, oh, yeah, okay. Or if you're my mama, you respond, baby, I hate Seinfeld. I don't know what you're talking about. So basically being a standardized patient, you are given a list, a case, a scenario, an illness, if you will, or complaint, an ailment, and you're given your full medical history, your age, where you work, what you eat, what your symptoms are, your trajectory of those symptoms and of your journey, and you have to basically play that out um, as standardized as possible with a medical student to help them basically, in a nutshell, get further along in their medical career, depending on um, if they're first year, second year, resident, the whole years with medical school, uh, never cease to amaze or kind of miff me, if you will. But that's basically what being a standardized patient is in a nutshell. Now, also, y'all, if you've listened to like two or more of my podcast episodes, y'all probably know that I have a love-hate relationship with most of Western medicine and the way in which our bodies are approached by like specialty as opposed to approaching the body holistically. The anger and judgment of quote, end quote, modern medicine is rooted in my own experience and in others that I've seen first and second and heard, I guess, third hand as well. So as a young child, my first memories of modern medicine were all rooted in trauma from a doctor who said my chronic stomach aches were due to UTIs, which then led to an emergency appendectomy at the age of seven when my hospital gown got all twisted and knotted and they had to cut my hospital gown down the middle, down the front middle, which was traumatizing because I was not only tired, exhausted out of it from constantly vomiting like Regan, Reagan, Regan, and the Exorcist, that's Linda Blair's character's name, and I thought they were like literally cutting me open while I was wide awake with the scissors, but it also felt like they were violating my privacy, my private parts, and wanted to see me naked quicker. That event, to a nurse sticking me about 15 times with an IV before an endoscopy until my mom grabbed her by the arm and said, get someone in here who, who knows what they're doing, girl. So my events dealing with doctors at a young age weren't positive, like that of a St. Jude or Shriners Hospital donate to us commercial, which you should donate to both of those causes. I know a lot of times I'm being facetious, but those are very good causes, both of them. Uh, my events of childhood medicine were more like that of a horror film, a low budget one at that. I tried to gain hope and faith in doctors, but I never could because just a few years after this appendectomy and endoscopy, these traumas, I started gaining weight. And every single time I saw a doctor for any single issue, the cure, the diagnosis, the comments were always like, well, Brooke needs to lose weight. 
If you've listened to my podcast specifically about being diagnosed and living with polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS, which is the third episode of the first season, then you know that my female endocrinologist's response to me passing out in the middle of a street from a new birth control that she had put me on was, well, these are things you'll have to deal with as a woman. I had little trust in the medical industry. And it was right around that time that I ran into a college professor who said to me, hey, Brooke, you speak French as your second language, right? To which I responded, mais oui, mon ami. And he said he may know just the gig for me. So he linked me up with a lady named Karen, who's such a nice person and totally not a Karen, who said I'd be playing the role of a standardized patient, but there would be no physical exam. Yes. And yes, that's sometimes part of it, y'all. We will get into the physical exam part of things later. And I'd be working with a partner. It was on communication skills. We would be playing a case that was essentially called the interpreter case, where one person is from a French speak is French speaking. I just said French speaking country, a French speaking country such as France or. Uh, Belgium or Haiti or French Canada, you get the idea. And the other is an overbearing relative who speaks both English and French, and they keep trying to answer for the actual patient whose main language is French, aside from un petit peu of English. And being an overbearing patient's helper who interjects when the patient is trying to talk, how much more perfect of a role can you get from me, Karen? Sign me up. The challenge for the student doctors is that they have to navigate the communication skills of balancing the power between these two relatives and allowing the French-speaking patient to be able to talk while also making sure the interpreter is interpreting correctly and not just paraphrasing or filling in with comments that they might um, think might be for the patient's best interest but really aren't. And the student doctor has to handle all that with both dignity and compassion. Woo! Woo! And they hire actors to do this because our job is to know how to read a room and be able to memorize a script or in the case of a standardized patient to memorize a case with all the illnesses and quirks and questions a doctor might ask or rather a student doctor might ask and to be able to improv when necessary on top of that. Because what a, st a student doctor has to ask a standardized patient, y'all, it in their cases is honestly always so, so, so much more than what like a resident or a graduated doctor would ask like a regular patient. And it's called standardized patient because you are playing a case that could happen like on any given Tuesday at urgent care or the general practitioner's or specialist's office, whatever the case may be, pun intended. And this is not the time for an actor to try to win an Oscar or channel their inner Sir Lawrence Olivier, who is a distant relative on my mama's side, FYI. For me, when I first started doing the cases, the beauty was that many of these cases were communication only. So I having an extensive amount of improv training, acting training, I felt like I had a sense of control in the room, control of myself because they weren't, you know, seeing my body, control of the doctor even in a sense. Then a good friend of mine who also did standardized patient at another medical school here in New Jersey asked me if I'd cover for her one day. And I'm always, or at least I was always, the eager actor slash freelancer who wants more gigs, more connections, more ways to generate income. I said, sure. Uh, like, you know, Audrey from Little Shop of Horrors, if you didn't catch the reference to the way I just said, sure. Before, I mean, provided that Audrey has to always talk with that voice. And why does she, right? Before realizing that the case I was doing involved a physical exam. I mean, and this is not uncommon in this realm, right? This is par, par for the course with standardized patient work. At that time, I was about 200 pounds, uh, um, lighter still than my previous weights, but also heavier than I wanted to be, and hence protective of my body and myself, especially among the medical community who had for so long chastised me or traumatized me. That's what I saw the medical community as. So when my friend told me that they'd just poke around on my belly a little, I was like, okay, 
I needed this $200. Let's go for it. Sidebar, y'all. The case was supposed to be like a workout instructor. I'm supposed to be a workout instructor. And back in the day, this was um, some time ago, um, workout instructors being plus size was not a thing at all. So I was a workout instructor who developed some back pain and burning upon urination. And I thought they were going to say, oh, the back pain is because you're overweight. But again, because we're being standardized, they knew that my weight was a lot lower than my regular weight. Like you give them a weight, right? Because you're standardized. Um, the diagnosis of that case ended up being pyelonephritis, which is basically kidney issues. And I went in trying to be game for anything, which is something I'm recently reworking on. Like I'm trying to approach life like, let me just be game for anything. And I was new to standardized patient at the time, newish. I had only really done the interpreter cases. So after about 20 students came in, like rapid fire, poking and prodding my stomach and gently handling my question, well, my character's question, but also my Brooks question of, I have back pain and I'm peeing a lot. Why are you poking and prodding on my stomach? I felt like I wanted to punch someone, but I was also grateful that I made money, you know, kind of in the line of work that I wanted to work in. But I noticed something else. When I went to the doctor a few months later for excruciating back pain that ended up being kidney stones, not necessarily pyelonephritis like my standardized patient role, but in the same realm because life imitates art, of course, I either was in so much pain or I, I was able to somehow have compassion for doctors in a whole new light or the doctor at that time this was nearly 16 years ago, was so awesome, and she still is, because I was able, despite my pain, despite hating the idea of the doctor, despite the system of modern medicine, I was able to see the humanity. My usual doctor at the time was busy with another patient, so I saw her partner, and I told the partner, look, I don't want to sound like I'm whining, but I think I'm dying here. To which she responded, you definitely are not whining. I don't see a whiner. I see a person who is in extreme pain and needs to go to the emergency room, stat. To this day, because of her bedside manner, ability to look me in the eye, read the room, and get shit done, this doctor, my other doctor at that time's partner, became and is still my primary care physician. And I'm not scared of her. I am scared of her nurse and office staff, however, but that's for another day and another podcast, y'all. I realize now that doing the standardized patient work made me able to see the medical field in somewhat of a different light. I just wasn't quite sure what that was yet. A few months after that, after healing up with the kidney stones, I started doing a different type of standardized patient case where we did the case, but instead of going from like room to room or student doctors coming in and out of the room and feeling like it was a big cattle call, our purpose was to go through a neurological exam, which is my favorite physical exam, y'all. I know it sounds weird, but the neuro exam involves doing like seated agility things. And then like the students will sometimes like scratch you um, and be like, does this feel the same and touch one finger? Does this feel the same and touch the finger on the other side to make sure both sides are working? And sometimes they'll like scratch you with this random pokey needle thing to which I get out of character and be like, pantomime that shit, student. And then you have to respond them. You have to respond to them appropriately um, because they're assessing if your migraines are also related to a neurological issue. Are y'all following me? And then after this exam, the students come back in and we're like, we've broken character, you know, and it's feedback time so I can respond as myself. It's actually like what they call the teaching moment, you know, where you're not just the standardized patient, but you're the educator. We actually for once got to talk to the students, got to see what they were thinking, got to see why they were nervous, got to see why they may have, for example, asked some of the sexual health questions in an awkward way. And they almost always did. Things like, do you prefer sex with men, women, or both? I mean, come on. And what could they 
do to ask these kind of questions better? That was always hard for me to instruct them on because I'm like, yeah, this is kind of a weird question. I always said, just barrel through it. Just barrel through it or say, this is a question I have to ask all my patients and just barrel through it. But you got to see the medical students as people who were also nervous. Ah, something an actor can relate to. Stage fright, combating said stage fright and being able to handle that. And these doctors, these student doctors had thoughts and feelings. Oh my, also something an actor can relate to. And it made me realize that doctors are just people too. We don't want to think of doctors as imperfect because we think and have been told that our lives are in the hands of doctors. But when we realize our lives are in our hands, or if I believe in a higher power, I believe our lives are also in God's hands, and that doctors are just one element to that puzzle, it helps make the doctor a lot more human, a lot more humane, and a lot less scary because it's not up to them to control it in a sense, right? Many of the cases I got with one particular standardized patient company were that of an overweight middle-aged woman. One case in particular, the gallbladder case, that physical exam was always fun. Not. My character's general diet involved canned green beans as one of the items. I was thinking, who eats canned green beans? Well, first off, there's that green bean casserole mama makes every Thanksgiving and Christmas. And second off, my dad eats canned green beans until I told him not to do so because I learned from this standardized patient case that they're very high in sodium. But y'all, also the average American person eats canned green beans, A, because they don't know that they're unhealthy, B, because that may be what their food budget allows them, or C, they think fresh green beans taste like shit, which they wouldn't be wrong. Another case that I always got cast as, the cholesterol case, my character's daily food intake involved a blueberry muffin for breakfast and takeout for lunch, something like General Sal's chicken, to which I always cringed when I had to answer that when the student doctor asked me what I ate in a typical day. I was judging my character, and I used to subsist on General Sal's chicken in college. Speaking of college, I was taught in college by many a wise professor to not to never judge my characters because you will not be able to portray them in the most honest way possible. And I never did judge my characters until I started doing these particular characters for standardized patient work. I told myself, Brooke, you aren't going to do any fairness to the students or to the medical college if you keep having this air of judgment when you respond to certain questions that go along with your case. And I think it was mainly because I was so frustrated about being in a larger body at that time, being cast in certain roles that were related to being in said larger body, and yet having my meal prep waiting for me on the other side of the uh, hospital curtain of sweet potatoes, spinach, baked turkey, and sometimes fresh freaking green beans waiting for me for lunch. This was also a reminder for me to not judge the characters I played and to also not judge myself and to also not judge others who were judging me at the same time either. But y'all, being a standardized patient, patient wasn't always kumbaya, life lessons learned for me. There were many times when a student doctor frustrated the living daylights out of me. Like the one time during feedback, during after the case was over and we got to talk to the students, mano y mano, if you will, um, I told the student doctor, well, the way in which you told me that made me feel like you were saying I'm basically on a surefire road to death. To which the student doctor responded, well, we all are on a surefire road to death, to which I wanted to respond, touche, great comedic timing, smartass, but at the time I was left speechless. Or another student, maybe it was even the same student who told me, well, I don't see the importance of me learning communication skills. I want to be a surgeon anyways. To which I responded, well, prospective surgeon, if you end up doing a surgery and end up killing the person, you'll have to go out and communicate that with their family members now, won't you, wise guy? But y'all, all in all, being up there, having the luxury to be up on that 
exam table, healthy as an ox, healthy-ish as an ox, and receiving a 1099 income for doing so, it became less about me worrying if they noticed I had a hole in my sports bra or forgot to shave my legs or if I looked fat to them, and more about helping the students try to do their best in order to hopefully save the face of modern medicine or at least be kind to their actual patient, perhaps to their overweight patient when they got out into the real world. Y'all, it's also a known fact, and I'll put it on my website. I'll put the link for this particular article on my www.brookhoover.com slash podcast. Go to this particular episode. Um, I will link the article for it. But a more communicative and likable doctor gets sued less than a nasty one. I'm just saying. And so is the New York Times. Now, you know, I'm not saying the best way for everyone to get over being scared of the doctor or having fears of their doctors being a standardized patient because it isn't quite that easy. Nor am I saying that if you're scared of the doctor to imagine the doctor in their underwear. I'm just saying to try to imagine that doctor as a human, sad to say, a human who has faults and maybe BO or bad breath, but hopefully a good medical degree. They're just there to help you along the way and save your fears for the medical world, for the dentist's office. Thanks so much for listening, y'all. It is my hope to inspire, uplift, and entertain you with this Who's Dat Fat Girl podcast. So if you're hungry for more, you can book me to speak or perform my solo show that inspired this podcast, Fat Girl Costumes, written by yours truly and directed by Brian Lady at your virtual or in-person event. Please visit brookhoover.com slash fluffybuttproductions or email me at contactbrookhoover at gmail.com for more info. And let's follow each other on Instagram. I'm at Brooke Hoover. And the O's in my name are not the letter O. They're zeros. Not because I want to be a size zero, but because I guess I'm just so clever with my late 90s Yahoo self. And if you like this podcast, which I really hope you do, please give me a five-star rating and write a review on Apple Podcasts. And most importantly, share this with your friends, family, and other people you may know who are as fat as we are. That's fat with a PH.